Otherwise, I will hand it off to Olivia. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for being here, everyone, for uh, Socially Engineering a Pathway to a Better Team. There, there's some of you I've been speaking with already who have kind of wondered, like, are you socially engineering me right now? I don't know. <laughs> but for those of you I have not yet met, my name is Olivia Liddell. You can find me on Twitter at Oli Ravi. It's kind of like ravioli, but flipped around. <laughs> I've actually never had ravioli before, so that's a thing. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and here we go. So a little bit about me before we uh, get into the content here. I'm a technical curriculum developer at AWS. I started there in November and I developed a training curriculum for people who are trying to prepare for our AWS certification exams. My specialty, uh, both with uh, the things that I just love uh, teaching people about, but also in my spare time, is security. I'm a certified ethical hacker and computer hacking forensic investigator. And I was doing security stuff as a kid, even before I realized that it was a legit thing. Like, any of you used to be on AOL back in the day? Some of you? So uh, one of my favorite things to do would be to create accounts to pose as their terms of service, like a uh, customer support team, and then try to get people's passwords through IM. I was doing this as a 12-year-old. So it's kind of appropriate that I'm up here talking about social engineering now. But I really like helping people understand how security works, how to keep themselves safe. And a lot of that ties into the other part of my background, which is in cultural anthropology and change management. So you'll see throughout this talk a lot of how this is all woven in together to really help you understand how to build a better team, not just by saying, well, let's do some trust falls or ax throws, I think is the new trend for team building, but really taking an intentional and methodical way to, um, to ensure that your team can move forward. So here's what we're gonna talk about today. It's gonna be broken into four areas, starting with how to assess your team's current strengths and areas of improvement, moving into developing an action plan to initiate change. Then we'll talk about some more with observation, doing that as an ongoing uh, practice to effectively manage change. And the last part, resolving conflict, especially if you have any team members with different communication styles. But beginning with a definition of what social engineering is, as I was preparing and researching this, I wanted to find a definition that I felt summed it up concisely without going too deep in the woods. And I like this one from the Security Through Education website that says, social engineering is any act that influences a person to take an action that may or may not be in their best interest. And you may have seen this as like someone who is uh, posing as a delivery person. They're trying to like hold this heavy box and get into a building and say, oh, I'm sorry, my hands are full. I can't scan my, my badge or things like that. So that's just one example of it. But if you really dive into social engineering, you'll see some of the same techniques that people do for, for bad purposes can actually be used by all of us here in this room for, for good things. And one of the books that I reference a lot throughout this talk is by Chris Hadnagy. It's called Social Engineering, The Art of Human Hacking. This is a really good book if you are looking to get into social engineering and learn more about it without getting too lost. He says that the goal of the social engineer is to get you to make a decision without thinking. And that's specifically because the more that you think, the more likely you are to realize you're being manipulated, which is bad for the attacker. Now, I know here we're talking about the attacker, we're like infiltrating systems and all this kind of like stuff. So you're not gonna be doing that with your team, but it is still the same kind of um, overall outcome that the more that you can get people to do things without them thinking about why they're doing them, it's, it's amazing how, how, um, how well you can convince people to do stuff. <laughs> Now, um, I want to start here with this picture and, and tell you a little story about where this talk came from. It was about a year ago. I was speaking at the Code Mesh conference that was held at the uh, Kalahari, Kalahari Resort in Sandusky, Ohio. It's like this huge water park with indoor slides, and um, it, it's just it's like a jungle, but in the middle of Ohio, <laughs> if you can imagine. And the, the thing about Code Mesh is that uh, at that conference, you may have to walk like 15, 20 minutes to get from the front desk to your room and back. And you really have to make some choices about where and how you're traveling. This isn't a picture of their front desk, but it's very similar. And um, what happened one day was that one of my friends had locked himself out of his room. And he was upset about this. And he realized, oh no, <coughs> I'm gonna have to go all the way back to the other side of the resort. I don't wanna get lost. Can, can you guys come with me for some moral support? So we're like, sure. 
So he's at the front desk. There's like actually 10 or so different agents working there, and the rest of us are sitting on the side. And one of my friends says in passing, like, you know, uh, do you think it'd be possible to get a key card to a room that's not yours? And the others in the group said, yeah, I guess. I mean, you probably could. Why not? And, and me, the security person in the group, I'd start making a list. Like, I, I was already thinking of, like, how and why I would do it. And my friends were saying, OK, Olivia, first of all, this is why we can never take you anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I thought this would be a great place to start because it can be an exercise to start thinking like a social engineer. So imagine you are a professional social engineer you have been tasked with trying to assess the security posture of this hotel and see if you can get in to get a key card for a room that's not yours completely by using non-technical means. How would you do it? What would you be looking for? Larry? Dress like I didn't just walk into the street, dressed like I got locked out of my room, so casual, thoughtfully dressed, maybe just another shirt or something. Yeah, so dressing like you want to fit in because, you know, if it's at the, the Kalahari where everyone is walking around in swimwear and like shorts, even though it's January, um, if you walk in in a business suit, that's when you know something's up. So you dress to fit in. I was going to say wear a swimsuit because you don't have your wallet with you, quote unquote. Ooh, okay. Taking it a step further. So dress to fit in with the look, but also the function. Like, hey, I'm wearing a swimsuit. Where can I put my, my key card? Not here. Okay. <laughs> Anything else that you notice or try to do? And why would you do that? Okay, so like being really hurried, like, oh, please just help me. Like, I just. It lessens the, their ability to, it's the last slide, it lessens their ability to take action. Exactly. Yeah. If I could see someone else go up and try to um, get one into their room, I would like to see how that interaction goes. Nice. Yeah, exactly. All these things are being pieced together. Like you, you see how people are looking, you see how they're, what they're doing, what those interactions look like. And that's exactly where we're beginning with this. It all starts with intentional observation. Now, here are some things I actually notice here. So I notice about the location. Huge resort that had some rooms that are about a 15 minute walk away from the lobby so you can play the whole like, I've been walking forever, please help me part. Uh, to Larry's point, most guests are wearing relaxed attire, shorts, swimwear, you dress the parts to fit in. And also notice the busiest times for the lobby were between 12 to 3 p.m. Now, as a social engineer, you can play this either way. If you're thinking, well, I wanna be here when it's busy and maybe get rushed through, that's when you strike or if you are trying to do another angle when it's slow and you wanna have more time with someone, you might go at some different off times. Now I notice about the front desk agents, in the afternoon there are about 10 of them who are working. You'd be in a line and then you would get called to the next one who, who called you over. How about this one? <laughs> I saw this and I thought, ooh. <laughs> the person who checked me in had the, the trade e badge, and I was thinking, I, I was a jet lag. I mean, I was traveling from just one time zone over, but still. But when I saw the new trade e badge, I thought, oh goodness, there, there's so much you can do with this because uh, either the, the trainee may not know enough yet, or they could be hyper uh, sensitive and aware to policy. So again, could go either way. A couple more things. Some agents were more, were more talkative than others. Some of them were smiling, using more hand gestures than others. And there are some differences in how they called out to the next person in line. So meaning that uh, there are some people who said, oh, next, next, next. And then there's another one who said, I'll take the next person over here and y'all have a wonderful day and I can't wait to serve you and chat with you. Which one do you think I wanted to go with if I'm really trying to get in here? The one who, who's talkative and chatty. So all of this leads into the first part of this, which is the need to observe your team from an outside perspective. Where I often see people go wrong with team building and team improvement is assuming that because they are a member of that team, they already know everything that there is to possibly know about how the team is made up, how they work, what the challenges and growth opportunities are. And I think that if you start from an outside perspective, I guarantee you're gonna see some things that you might not have realized were actually there. Now this is where we get into the anthropology piece that I mentioned. Uh, have any of you ever taken anthropology courses before? To it. It's like on the Discovery Channel when they're not showing aliens and stuff and they actually have someone who goes to a different village or culture and they're getting to know the people there and their way of life. That's cultural anthropology. And one of the books that I read in college that really connects into this is by James P. Spratley, Participant Observation. 
he talks about this practice within anthropology called ethnography. And, he, and it's the work of describing a culture. I like his definition because he says, the central aim of ethnography is to understand another way of life from the native point of view. So not from your point of view, but trying to understand someone from how they see themselves and how they see what they're doing. He continues on to say, rather than studying people, ethnography means learning from people. Do you all see the difference here? You're not just kind of sitting in the corner and, and staring, but you're really trying to be intentional about this to really learn and understand. So how do you do this? You start by describing your team. We're gonna start with some of the basics and work our way up to things that are a little bit more complex, but you might think about the size of your team, like how many people are on it, are you spread across different locations, and what percentage of your team members are remote. What's interesting about this is when I first prepared this, this talk, I was working on a team where we were a little bit hybrid. Like we could work remotely a few days a week, but then we were also in the office a few days a week. Now I'm on a team that's fully 100% remote, spread across the country. And now I'm having to rethink a lot of these things because it's not to say that if you're remote, you can't do these things, but you need to look at it in a slightly different way because you don't have all those different um, opportunities for being at the water cooler and hearing about how someone's weekend was or kind of passing them in the hallway and seeing how they look after coming out of a stressful meeting. And also thinking about if your team is single department or cross-functional. What I'll say here is that with all of these, these, um, these aspects of describing your team, you don't want to look at it and say, oh, I've seen this one thing, so I'm going to make a complete judgment call based on this one thing that's there. Rather, it's more of a data point. You know, you're getting multiple data points, you're seeing what's there, and then eventually once you have a more complete picture, you can start to see what some of the patterns are. Something that might cause uh, issues within, within a team could be a range of technical skills. Like if you have some members who are a little, are a little bit newer than others, there's not a lot of cross skill sharing and collaboration. Also wonder, how long has your team been together? That's another thing that I've seen in my experience where it, it can go either way. There are some teams that work really well together and they just got together five months ago. Other teams have been together for five years and just because a team has been together longer doesn't automatically mean that they're in a better place than a newer one. And also, which members tend to speak most often in meetings? I mean, have any of y'all noticed that about your team? Like there's always that one person who always has something to say and you're like, you're ready to get out of the meeting and they're, they're saying last call for questions and you're like, it's five o'clock, we can go. And they're like, to play devil's advocate, yeah, that, that person. So again, not to say that person's bad, but just notice that that person is there. <laughs> and that, that connects to this next one, which is, do you have any members of your team who prefer to share their ideas through other communication channels? So a question for you all about this. Do you have anyone on your team who they never say anything in meetings, they never talk, you've never even heard their voice, but they do not stop talking in chat? So that's a thing that you can look at that and say, well, I wonder why that is. And I wonder if I'm trying to roll out this new change and initiative and get people to share feedback. Joe doesn't like to speak up in meetings, so I'm, not, I'm probably not gonna get his input there. Perhaps I can ask Joe for his feedback over chat because that's where he, he tends to be more vocal. So little things like that that can add up to bigger things. And meanwhile, Joe has no idea that you've been noticing this. A couple more here. How frequently do your more senior members pair together with more juniors? This is something that you wanna consider when you're thinking about sharing, collaboration, figuring out how you can foster this knowledge transfer. And lastly, how do your team members interact with each other outside of meetings or project settings? If you're remote, this one may be a little bit trickier to assess, but I, I do encourage you to even just ask your, your colleagues about this to say like, oh, hey, um, how's it been going with you and, and so-and-so? Or if there's a new person who's joined the team, sometimes managers may ask, um, how's it been going with this person's onboarding? Is, is there anything you've noticed that you might wanna share? So thinking about how these interactions look when they're not in meetings and they're not in projects, I've had it to be times where in meetings we're fine, but outside of that, there's a lot of disconnect. So all of this comes to what do people value? You're gonna see me show this question quite a bit throughout this because with social engineering, this is what it all comes down to. You're starting with these observations. You're starting to see what people are doing, how they're acting, how they're behaving, but really, when it comes to you trying to convince them to do something, I want you to start thinking about how it's not why you want them to do that thing, 
but why they will want to do that thing. So what do they value? You go into the next phase of this, which is developing an action plan and beginning with quick wins. Even if you have this really large initiative that you have for your team, I like the idea of starting with quick wins, and I'll show you some examples of this from social engineering and also connect it back to team. But story time. Have any of you ever done archery before? Like bow and arrow? Why did I do a sound effect? Okay. Why don't you do a sound effect? What's that? Why shouldn't you do something? Yeah. I did it again. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so quite a few of you. Okay. Didn't expect that. Um, actually, my Fitbit buzzed because I just passed my Taylor step goal with that little bow and arrow thing. <laughs> um, next question for you. How many of you are actually good at archery? And see, no hands went up there. Okay. Same here. So a couple years ago, I, I went to this archery experience that was somewhere on the north side of the city. And it's a pretty cool thing where you go in there and they give you like a 30 minute intro lesson and they tell you how to shoot the bow, how not to shoot things that you shouldn't be shooting. And then they give you like two hours to just have fun with it. Now, let me tell you, I walked up in there with so much swagger. I was like Katniss from the Hunger Games. Like, I'm like, I'm about to get the middle of this, this bullseye. And then I went through the lesson. And then suddenly my expectations were realigned. <laughs> and I was thinking, if I just get this bow anywhere on that, on that board, I am calling it successful. You know, and how often does that happen with things that we do in work? We start out with these really lofty goals. Like we want to get right in the middle there, but we realize for any number of reasons that just can't happen. And it's exactly like that with social engineering when you're thinking about what you want to get out of your target. Chris Hadnagy goes into this again. In his book, he says, as a social engineer, you need to remember that you don't need to automatically go for the exact flags or the exact outcomes, so to speak, that you need. Instead, what you wanna do, get some minor ones to help build those feelings that'll lead the person to concede and comply. It's kind of like the snowball effect of manipulation, if you will. And the way that I'm connecting this over to team building is a strategy of good, better, and best. This is how social engineers work when it comes to figuring out what they can get out of their target. And it's a great way to start thinking about the goals that you have for your team, how you can communicate those expectations, and really get some, um, some positive changes coming, even if they're small at first. So before the team example, let's talk about the hotel. Going back to that example of you've been tasked with trying to get the key card to a room that's not yours. Imagine if you went to the front desk and the only thing that you were hoping to get out of that person was a key card. Like, even if they're giving you all this other stuff, you're like, nope, nope, you're not giving me the, you're not giving me the key card yet, la, 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 I don't care about that. You're missing out on all this other really good information that's coming out there. So if we were to structure this as good, better, best for the hotel, good could be any kind of personal information that they can provide, like possibly the, someone's phone number, email address, or the type of credit card that was used to reserve the room. Sometimes this stuff happens even when you don't intend for it to. Uh, quick story about this. Last summer, I was hiking through Utah, and it was July, and hiking through Utah in July is just not a good decision for, for many reasons. It's really hot there. And I was coming back to the hotel, I was completely wiped out. I was so tired, so exhausted. I was like a zombie going through there. And by the time I got back to my room, which was at the very end of the hallway, it had done that thing that you know credit card or hotel cards do where sometimes they deactivate themselves. So I had to go all the way back down to the front desk. And I could barely talk. Like I was just mumbling. I was like, oh my God, it doesn't work. And so she should have asked me for some, some verification. But she said, like, oh, we can just let me just look it up with her phone number. It's um, something, 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 99231. I was like, wait, what? And before I knew it, she was telling me all of this personal information about my, myself. And I, I was completely wiped out from hiking, but that made me perk up and realize I could do something with this. So opportunities are there. Uh, and that can lead to something better, like a room number, all the way up to getting a key card to access the room. So even though in the social engineering example, we're aiming for best, there's still all these other little things that are there that you can piece together, use your advantage, and get the outcomes you're looking for. Now for a team example, let's go back to what we were talking about before with juniors and seniors not really having a lot of knowledge transfer and pairing together. I've been on many teams where that's the case. Uh, seniors know a lot of things, they've been through, they have a lot of experience, but they're not sharing that with juniors. 
suppose you're the team lead, and you're trying to figure out how to make that better, and you say, we need a mentoring program. Like, that is all I want, nothing else but mentoring. If mentoring doesn't happen, then we are not successful. And, you know, if that doesn't happen, then you think, well, we tried. But if you restructure that through good, better, best, an example of this could be good, more juniors asking for help from the seniors. You know, that's progress. Because if right now you're seeing that juniors and seniors are just not talking, juniors don't feel comfortable with asking seniors, seeing that as progress is good because then that can lead to something better, which could be lunch and learn sessions to share knowledge and build skills. Finally, that works up to best. So that formal mentorship program that you're looking for there. So do you see, kind of see how this is structured? That if you structure it as a good, better, best and communicate this to your team members, they have the expectation that, yeah, we're working to get here, but you know what? We've got some smaller steps that we can work towards to try to get there. That, I think, is one of the best ways to go about um, making these steps forward with your team, making it transparent so that they don't feel, well, you know, if we don't do that, there's nothing at all that we try. Uh, it, it's kind of like that saying, uh, have any of you heard, um, shoot for the moon, but if you don't reach the moon, you'll still land amongst the stars or something. It's like on Pinterest and all that stuff. Uh, so <laughs> there's, I, I wanted to put one GIF in here, which is one of my favorites, which is, it's like this. So if you try, <laughs> I just like sending this to people. <laughs> so you've been observing, you've been breaking it down into these, these action plan with quick wins, and now people are doing things, yay. But your observations don't stop. It's like if you're at that front desk at the hotel, you don't stop noticing what's going on once you're there. You see how things shift. You see how people's behavior may change. And not just how, but also thinking about why that is. You know, when you start getting into these team building exercises, ideally it looks like this. Everyone's hands are in and we're all happy and we're about to do a hurrah, but it doesn't always look like this, right? For many reasons, there are some outliers, people who are resistant to change. Either they don't want the change or they, they kind of want it, but they don't know how to change. And it can be any number of reasons. And because of that variation, that's why it's so important to continue making these observations. And we're going beyond what do they value, that question that we mentioned before, but also looking at what's in it for them and why should they want to do this. I, I will honestly say of all the content that's in here and as someone who's done this in practice, this can be one of the most difficult things to internalize. Because think about when you're asking a favor of someone, you're asking somebody to do something for you, you're usually thinking about why you want that thing, but you've got to take a step to the side, look at it from their perspective, have some empathy for them, and try to understand why they would want to do that thing. In a previous job, I was a technical trainer uh, for a company that was a Google partner, and I would travel to different customers of ours and train their end users on how to use G Suite, Google Drive, things like that. So these would be companies that would be in another kind of platform like um, Exchange, Outlook, and suddenly the switch is being flipped to Google Drive. And there's, there could be a lot of resistance to that. I would have customers come to me and say, hey, Olivia, this change isn't working. It, it's not going well. No one likes this. It's, it's over. Fix it. And my question for them would be, where exactly is, is the resistance happening? Because there's a difference between what you see with like desire, knowledge, ability, and so forth. This, I highly recommend to any of you who need some like, insights into a framework to use for change management. It's from a company called ProSci that has put together what's called the ADCAR model for change management. And they break the change management step or the process into five different phases uh, from A to R. I've highlighted the three in the middle in blue because I think that those are the ones that are most relevant and applicable here. But think about if there's someone who's resistant to change and they're not liking the new, the new things that are going on. There's a difference between someone who desires to support the change, um, but doesn't know how to do it, and they don't, they're not able to do it, versus someone who, they've got the desire, like they're in on that, and they know how to do it, but they're not able to actually follow through and execute in the way that you need them to. You kind of see the differences that are there? And this is where observation really comes into play, because if you are responding to someone's resistance based on saying, well, they're not doing the thing I want them to do, it's got to be that they don't have the desire, 
but they actually do have desire. They do have knowledge. What they need is for you to respond at the ability level. So keep this in mind as you're observing and trying to see if they're not buying in, where do they best fit here and how can I help them move forward with that? Let me give you an example of this with the hotel. Let's say we're thinking about desire and why someone would want to do something. Thinking about what they value, perhaps this front desk agent values helping the guests have a smooth and positive interaction. You know, people really like their jobs. They really take pride in that. And you can use that to your advantage. <laughs> and if that is something that you can use, then you're, you're making that decision of how you're acting based on what you've seen of, of them. Maybe uh, to your point earlier, you're talking about like you're kind of wanting to move through quickly. They could notice that they want to help someone who's in distress have a much better day. I think, you know, when I was hiking through Utah, that's why she helped me because I was looking really distressed, y'all. I was just like, I can't get into my room. And she's like, ooh. <laughs> so she helped me and I wasn't trying to manipulate her. But now that I know that about her, I could have gone back and tried to get something else. Or you can see, depending on the agent, they might value being able to quickly move on to the next guest, like let's get in, move forward, or they might want to spend more time making a meaningful connection. These are all the things that you can see through observing and when you're thinking about the desire, what's there, what do they value? I'm gonna give you a team example coming up in our last section here, but just wanna uh, get into this by talking about the rationale for this last section, which is how to resolve conflict within the context of social engineering and a team building approach. And I think the way to do this is to really offer a solution and value that are based on your observations. And in this case, you're not just saying, here's what I want you to do, but here's what I want you to do, and here's why you should do this based on what it is that I've seen. Uh, I'm a fan of like ridiculous stock photo images. So this, <laughs> when I looked up conflict, this happened. <laughs> and the caption for this, uh, it was so bad, I wrote it down. It is um, diverse business people tugging on a rope. <laughs> I have so many comments about this right here. <laughs> but <laughs> I kind of want to frame this too. But conflict can look like this sometimes, right? Uh, despite all the other weird things that are kind of going on here, what I do like about this is the idea that sometimes conflict can feel like there's one person on one side of this and you're being outnumbered by some people on the, the other side. Have any of y'all ever felt like that in team conflict? Me too. And um, when this happens, I think that it's important to remember, okay, we're in this point of contention here. Something's not going right. And also too, conflict doesn't have to be a big yelling, screaming thing. Sometimes it can be like, really just regular conversations that have some kind of underlying disconnect that's there that may have the potential to build into um, something larger. Now, before we get into the story, just as a reminder, what do they value? What's in it for them? And why should they want to do this? To illustrate this example, I want to tell you a story. And I, I was working on the, these slides at the time when I was doing my annual rewatch of The Office, so I figured, why not put Dwight and Jim in here? <laughs> and uh, this was two jobs ago, I believe. I was working at a company, uh, and I had a team of five other people who were all in the same role together. One of my coworkers put in his two weeks' notice and was resigning, and then that left the question of who was going to pick up the slack for his project. Now, all of us had the same title, same role, and we all did the same work, but for different clients of ours. His clients, though, it was kind of like the Wild West. Nothing went according to, to standards. Nothing at all was documented. He just kind of did what he um, thought they needed and work got done. But if he had a sick day, my goodness, like you did not want to be the person covering for that. So uh, I, I kind of had a feeling what was going to happen. And sure enough, my manager said to me, hey, Olivia, I'm going to need you to take over all of his um, work for the time being. I thought, okay, nothing's documented, but we'll, we'll figure out how to get through this. And at the same time though, I wanted to make sure that I would not be the only person responsible for getting the new knowledge, because if something happened to me, then no one in this company would know anything. So I asked Dwight and I asked Jim, hey, um, with him leaving, would you mind just sitting in on a couple of those knowledge transfer meetings just to make sure there's more of us who are getting uh, the info about what needs to be done? That sounds simple enough, right? You would have thought I'd asked them for a kidney. <laughs> they were just, the, the answers that I got back from them weren't just no. It was no, but so over the top that with this observation that's coming in, I realized, wait a minute, 
there, this is kind of weird and interesting and I, I don't know what's going on here. So I asked Dwight if he would help me and, and sit in on these meetings and Dwight said to me, you know, Olivia, like, I really want to help you. I want to help you more than anything, but um, I have to ask our manager first if it's okay. That was never our process. It wasn't like I was trying to give him all of the extra work. I'm just asking, sit in on a meeting. So when he said that, I knew something was a little bit off, but I couldn't figure out why. I asked Jim, and Jim said kind of the same thing. It's like, Olivia, th thank you for, for asking. You know, I really want to help you, but before I can help you, we need to fix Jira first. Like, my, and I, I thought, like, that's never going to happen. Jira is always going to be a hot mess. So therefore, you're not going to be able to help me. And I, I, I just thought, what is going on here? And why is, is this happening? This was conflict. Even though we weren't yelling at each other, something was going on, and I need to figure out how to fix it. So here's the other part here. Their communication styles were kind of all over the place, too. I recognized from my observations that Jim was more on the indirect and passive side. Dwight, on the other hand, is more assertive and direct. So here I am faced with the question of how do I respond to these two team members who have very different communication styles? What's my approach with this going to be? And when it comes to resolving conflict, this is by no means intended to be a fully exhaustive approach for that because there's, I mean, you could talk all day for a conflict resolution. But I think if you want to layer in some social engineering inspired strategies, first would be be assertive, but not aggressive. Usually when it comes to social engineering and people who are trying to get their way into something, you have to act like you belong, right? Like if you're that person who's carrying the big delivery box or the person who's asking for a key card, you have to believe in the power of what you're saying. And it's exactly like that when you're trying to resolve conflict. Be assertive, know what you're asking for, but make sure that you don't veer into that territory of being aggressive and, and kind of angry, even though tensions may get flared up. And also make your elevator pitch. The reason for this is that when you are trying to resolve something and you're trying to get people to, to fix the, what, what's going on between them, you need to keep it simple at first. And I think this is especially true for people who are on like the Dwight side, who are like, hey, I don't have 10 minutes to listen to you telling me like why you want this to happen. I just need to know what you want me to do. And I think often what happens when it comes to resolving conflict is that we get so caught up in the why and how we want that to happen that it's not very clear what we want that other person to do. Does that make sense? So be direct. Tell them what it is that you want. And make sure that you're doing this from the angle of what it is that they value. Now, unfortunately, the, the way that this played out was uh, not ideal for what I wanted. I had to enlist the manager's help to, to have like a whole team powwow for how we needed to get better at helping each other because I had been the person who was always helping them. Uh, and, and when I needed help, they were never helping me. So it, it hurt in that regard. But if I could go back and do it differently, I would ask for, uh, for help from them in a way that's based on what it is they value. So what I observed about Dwight, he was someone who has a very efficient and methodical workflow. I mean, very. It, it's, it's crazy how much these two characters are, are like the real people that I've worked with, seriously. But um, he was very process-oriented and driven. And the, the client that I had to take over, like I said, there was no processes in place. So let's compare how, how this ask would look. The way I asked him was, hey, Dwight, you know, he's leaving, and I, I'm feeling kind of overwhelmed with this. And would you mind helping me? All of, all of what I said was like, me, 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 right? The way I should have done it would be to say, hey, Dwight, you know, um, he's leaving, and uh, yeah, I'm really going to miss him um, because he just didn't have a chance to document his processes. But I, I know you're so good at that. You did such great work on that last project the other month. And I know we could really be benefit from having you working on this account. You see the difference there? And it, it's with all of this, there's no guarantee that it would have been a yes. But it probably would have. You know, from going from that angle, based on what Dwight values, I was getting myself a little bit closer to getting the yes, because it's less about me and more about him. Same with Jim. What I noticed about him and what he values was that he, he wanted to learn a lot of new skills that could possibly lead to a promotion. Now, again, the way I asked him was, uh, Jim, I'm just 
I, I don't know how I'm going to handle it when he's gone, and I, I, I don't want to be the only person responsible for this. Once again, me, 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 I, I, I. What I should have done would have been to say, hey, Jim, you know, he's leaving, and it's, it's, it's so bad, but um, how, how's it going with your, um, your skill building? I know you were trying to look for that promotion, and oh, right, um, his account uses Blackboard, but I don't think you know Blackboard yet, do you? Of course I know, like, I, I know these things, but you know, you kind of feign ignorance like you don't. And then Jim could have made the, put the pieces together and realized that what I'm asking him is actually an opportunity for him to get some more skills. So that's kind of the difference there, coming at it from that angle based on what they want. Lastly would be follow up with relevant examples or metaphors. And this is where you need to kind of balance items two and three on this list because as much as you do need to have that direct elevator pitch, when you're resolving conflict, sometimes you do need to give some examples or metaphors to help your team members understand the why. Um, this is kind of cringy, but I'm gonna share it anyway because it's a good example of this. With my team, I was using the example of a Band-Aid, like I needed a Band-Aid to fix this, and it, it was working pretty well. And they were kind of buying into it at first, but then as I started talking about a Band-Aid factory and how things work in the Band-Aid factory and how there's gears and widgets, and I'm cringing just thinking, thinking about it. The faces that some of you are giving me right now is exactly how that was. So the, the takeaway here is, no, uh, just like with social engineers, when you can stop and when you have gotten that, okay, I, I bought in, please don't take me to the Band-Aid factory. <laughs> and so in conclusion, to kind of tie up everything we've been talking about, these are some steps that will help you use a social engineering approach for team building, observing your team from an outside perspective. Imagine that you are needing to, I hate to say case the place, but you know, you, you need to see how it is from an outsider's view. Then when you're developing an action plan, start with those quick wins. That leads into observing how and why your team members are responding to change. Don't stop observing just because you've kicked off um, some change. And lastly, resolve conflict by offering a solution and value that are based on your observations. <coughs> I'm gonna share these slides on the meetup page. I've got the link I can post up on there, but I just wanna walk you through a couple of the resources that are here in case you wanna learn more. Chris Hadnagy's book that I talked about earlier. Any of you all familiar with Kevin Mitnick? He's like the, uh, I don't know if they call him the godfather or the grandfather of social engineering, but he's the one who's very famous for making this a legitimate practice. And there's also the anthropology book I mentioned there. A few other resources that have to do with team dynamics and team profiles and a direct link to the pro side page in case you wanna dive more into change management. So as we're wrapping up, I just wanna go back to where we started, this lovely hotel here. And as you're doing all these things, I really encourage you to never lose sight of why you are doing them. It's not just about looking at your team members. It's not just about saying, well, here's a checklist of what we're following. Why are you doing these things? Ultimately, the outcome is to really have better team engagement, right? So that you can keep them checked in so they won't check out. Get it? Hotel? Check in? <laughs> all right, thank you all so much. <laughs>